All right. Well, today we have Jeff Sinners here with us. Excited to have Jeff on the show today. Jeff's the pastor at Riverland. Jeff, how are you today? Doing great, man. Great. Uh, uh, just pumped to be with you as always. Awesome. Awesome, man. When, uh, when I started this podcast, I, I thought to myself, man, I, I know Jeff. I love Jeff. I want to have Jeff on because he's just got such a heart for the church, for leaders. And I wanted other people to hear your story and just be influenced by just the way you talk and the way you, you think. So, so let's just start off, Jeff. Tell me a little bit about your story, man. How did you get to Riverland and, and just a little bit, little bit about you? Well, I grew up right there in, uh, in your backyard in uh, Hazard, Kentucky, right down the road, about 10 minutes in a little uh, thriving metropolis known as Sassafras, Kentucky, which I will forever claim I'm not from Hazard. I'm from Sassafras, Kentucky. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> um, but uh, no, anyway, I was in the, you know, I just uh, uh, lived life, went to college, went to Moorhead State, go Eagles, and uh, um you know, got a job and uh, grew up in church, but, you know, kind of, you know, when I left home in, in college, just got away from the Lord, uh, lived about 10 years of my life, just kind of doing that prodigal son kind of lap, you know, uh, just, you know, trying to figure out who I was and work, you know, and sowing, you know, uh, some uh, wild oats and, and, and all that. And, and, uh, you know, just through a series of events, God brought me back home and told me he had a, a plan for my life. And I believed him and just threw myself into the local church, uh, up in, uh, I, I was, and, and worked in the corporate world. I was, uh, you know, that was really my story. And that's part of why I love the local church. Uh, just because, you know, I just threw my, I just totally bought in, you know, I mean, I, when I rededicated my life to the Lord in 1998, I just went all in, in the local church and served and just served my pastor and just, uh, let God slowly, um, you know, develop my character, develop my, my closeness, you know, um, and, uh, and, and I did that for years and then, and then we moved back to hazard and I, I just, you know, i had an insurance practice there for 13 years and worked in that field for 17 years. So I was just serving in the local church, wasn't on staff, just uh, serving, serving and, and preaching and teaching and missions and groups and worship and prayer and all those things. But yet I had a corporate, you know, a day job as well until, you know, God began to stir in my heart that he had more for me. Uh, and, uh, and finally that, that call came. Uh, in 2012, the Lord just spoke to me uh, after just a season of pre preparing me for that, that he was giving me a father's heart mm -hmm. and that I was to go to Charleston, South Carolina. That was all he told me. But I knew what that meant. I knew that meant that I had to plant a church. And uh, so I called Mark Combs. <laughs> he was the only guy that I knew that had planted a church that didn't close in six months. So <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I really did. I had no network, really. I was in an independent, you know, church. I really didn't have, I wasn't really well connected in that regard. And, you know, you, you, you gave me a book to read and we had some great conversations. And I just spent the next year and a half really just becoming a student of church planting and, you know, learning everything that I could about how to plant a church. And during that time, we moved to the Charleston area, landed in Somerville, South Carolina, which is a little su suburb of Charleston in 2014 and I, I found a tribe uh, known as the ARC, the Association of Relate, Relational Related Churches uh, at, based in Birmingham, not a denomination, but an association. They helped us plant, trained us, gave us support. And we launched in 20, January of 2014. And we knew no one in this city. We came here just totally, uh, we had one family that moved with us. We, we had no team. We had uh, just a minimal amount of money no venue, no building, uh, you know, none of that. We just totally came on a word from God, trusting him, sold everything. And we were only here about six months uh, be before we planted the church. We built our team here from the community and uh, just prayed and fasted. And we, we, you know, we did some marketing and got the word out. And on the first day at the, at the movie theater, God, God gave us an opportunity to, to plant a church in a movie theater on Sundays. And uh, the first day we had 284 people show up, 19 people that day uh, raised their hand and filled out a card to make a, a decision to, uh, to follow Christ. And, 
And what's crazy is 215 came back the next Sunday. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so it, it was, it was a miracle. It really was a miracle because I know I'm not that good. And mm -hmm. I know that, you know, in the natural, you don't move to a city where you don't know anyone only live there for five or six months, bring nobody with you no training and have that kind of thing happen. So uh, Riverland church was born in 2014 and uh, we, uh, we grew and, you know, added services and, you know, and, and, and continued, you know, since then. And uh, God's just done uh, more than I could ask or imagine uh, through this journey in me personally and, uh, you know, in, in our community as well. So uh, I'm just, I've learned more in these past six or seven years than I probably did in the, in the, in the 20 before that. Uh, it's been a steep learning curve. I'll say that. But God has just been so faithful, and uh, man, and and honestly, I've I've loved every minute of it. It's mm -hmm. been it's been tough, but I've loved it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, one of the things, knowing your story, one of the things that God has really given you a passion for is leaders and the health of leaders and and just their hearts, their souls. Uh, so even diving into your story a little bit there, how, where did that come from? Why do you think that God just really gave you a hunger to see leaders in churches lead from a healthy place. Yeah. You know, it is so amazing, Mark, how that when you just, you know, when you look back over your life, how God uh, just used events and people and, you know, and you start to kind of, you know, piece it together and you see how he was working, you know, to just bring you to that point, even when you don't realize it as you were going along. And one of the things, or the opportunities that I had uh, was about a year after we launched, you know, we had, we did have a great launch, uh, relatively speaking, you know, and so the ARC asked me to be one of what they called their launch coaches. So I started coaching uh, new church planters, uh, two or three guys a year in the process of planting a church. And so, you know, I got to talk to them about the, you know, how to, how to do all that, but, but invariably in those conversations they would always drift toward how are you doing how how's your marriage you know how, how you know tell me about your family and you know just tell me about how you're feeling about what you're doing and you know it was it was much more than just giving them you know the uh, breaking down the, the playbook and the dashboard of the you know how to plant a church yeah. and i didn't realize but but slowly you know i was i was getting a heart you know not just to help these guys i knew i loved helping these guys plant churches cuz I, I i i still do but it was more than that you know that that i was being able i think to help them not just uh, with the machine to build something, but maybe emotionally, spiritually as well. And, um, and, and even, you know, with that, and even in my own journey, just seeing the day-to-day, -day, you know, struggles that pastors go through, you know, the, the, the highs and the lows, uh, you know, I love in Ephesians three, you know, Paul, uh, the prayer that he prays, yeah. Paul, probably, you know, one of my, probably besides Jesus, you know, the, my hero of the Bible, uh, my, my guy. And I, you know, and I would have loved to, I would have loved to have been in the room when Paul prayed. Think about that. If you could have, if you could have been a fly on the wall and listening to the apostle Paul get on his knees and pray, man, wouldn't that have been powerful to be in the room for that? Yeah. Just so awesome. And, but what's cool is we get a little, we get some of that from scripture. You know, we do hear some of Paul's prayers and I love, I love one of his prayers there in Ephesians three, when he prays for, you know, leaders and for the church, he said that we might know the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of his love. And, and what that just tells me is that man, as a leader, and even as a Christian, you're going to have some high highs, but you're going to have some low lows. Yeah. And you're going to have some days that you swing all the way over here emotionally and you swing all the way the, the other, you know, direction emotionally. And, and what's cool is, though, is that Paul prayed that in every sphere, no matter how high or how low you get or, you know, how far you get emotionally, that in every in every situation that you might know the love of Christ. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. You know, and 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 so I'm just, you know. And, and so at the highs and lows of leadership, you know, being, being settled and, and rooted and grounded and finding that, you know, the love of Christ in all those moments, you know, I think it's so, so important. Yeah. So God's just kind of grown my, you know, just like he was doing when I was, grow, you know, working and serving in the local church, he was growing my heart for ministry and I didn't even know it. I think through coaching those church planners and 
just, you know, seeing the day to day, you know, challenges of leadership and pastoring, God has grown my heart to share that and help others. Yeah. You know, you talk about those, those day to day duties and things of, of pastoring and just, just ministry. And, and so many times, you know, like you said, coaching other church planners, talking to church leaders, it just seems like the grind of ministry, if we can say it that way, the grind of ministry causes them, they just, they just fall into this place of complacency. Um, a lot of, a lot of church leaders just throw in the towel and, and walk away, or they just figure out a way to, to just grind on, do the stuff, but they're, but they've lost their heart. Uh, how does that happen to us? Yeah. You know, um, I would encourage any, any church leader, anybody in ministry leadership at any level, read second Corinthians chapter four, but read it, put, put on your, put on your leader glasses and read that through the eyes of a leader. Okay. Read, read it from a leadership perspective and, you know, and, and what it says is it starts in the first couple verses and in the last couple verses, it says this, therefore we do not lose heart. One day, just, it was really, I was going to speak to a group of, of pastors and leaders uh, at an event and I just, you know, and I felt so unqualified to be honest. I really did. I was intimidated by, you know, to, to even be in that, have that opportunity. And I just asked God to give me a word for him. And the Holy Spirit, I believe just, he, he just sat down. I just sat down one day for two hours and read that chapter really slowly. And God just told me, read it through the eyes of a leader. And, and the Holy Spirit just pulled out so many truths out of that one chapter for leaders. And, and what, that was one of the things that, that I had never noticed in that, that it starts and ends with, therefore, we don't lose heart. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, over and over again, the pattern of leadership is um, encouragement. Uh, from from God and from others, and that's the part part of the reason why is because discouragement is the occupational hazard of what we do. Hmm. Yeah, it's 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 going to happen every time that God calls anybody. You know, he 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 has to encourage them because that invariably is just going to happen. It's it's going to happen on a, on probably a weekly basis. And so we have to, I think, just get our hearts in a place where we can deal with that. You know, one of the, one of the challenges for me, and I think for a lot of leaders, especially when you're new uh, to leadership, is finding a rhythm, you know, finding a, a, a daily and a weekly and a seasonal and annual rhythm that you can do this and, you know, stay married, love your wife, love your kids, love what you do. Uh, you know, and stay healthy. And, and that was really one of the biggest things that, that after about two years, I kind of hit a wall and I really had to get intentional about finding a rhythm that uh, would allow me to do this. And so there's a lot of intentionality, you know, that, 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 that has to happen if you're going to do this and stay healthy doing it, because it, it, it's not going to come find you, you know, yeah. you have to, you have to, you have to go and make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's, let's talk to, you know, the, the church leader, somebody that's listening and they've hit that wall. You know, just, you said, you said you came to the place, you hit that wall. They, they feel like Jeff, you, you're just speaking to me, man. You're reading my mail. I've lost heart. Uh, I feel like I've hit a wall. And I know that one of the things that you and I have been talking about, you are passionate about, um, is just reigniting the passion of the church, reigniting passion of leaders. And so just, just walk us through that. What would you say uh, to a leader like that feels like they've hit the wall? Um, how can they get that back? How can they get that passion yeah. and hunger uh, back? Yeah. Man, that's such a great question. I think, Mark, you know, anytime that you are discouraged, anytime that you are uh, depressed or really just questioning, you know, should I sell cars? You know, nothing against car salesmen, but you know, God, should I go do something else? You know, have you really called me to do this? I mean, is my time up? Uh, and, and sometimes that is the case. I mean, let's just be honest. Sometimes that season is up. Yeah. Uh, it is time for you to step into a new role. You never have to worry about job security in the kingdom of God. God always has something for you to do. Mm -hmm. So that's don't, don't, you know, maybe that, you know, that could be happening. 
and I'm not saying that it's not, but here's what I would, here's, here's a filter question that I would ask. Why did you get in to leadership in the first place? Okay. Yeah. Go back and ask yourself, you know, why did I become a pastor in the beginning? What, you know, what, why did I decide to do this? Or, you know, did God call me? Did I think it was just a good idea? You know, what, why did you say yes? You know, what was it? What was that, for lack of a better word, what was that first love? Yep. You know, and, and what, you know, and sometimes I think to reignite, uh, you know, uh, our, our passion, we have to go back to what ignited it to begin with, you know? And, and, and just go back to that basic fundamental question. And sometimes it's even, I think, uh, just maybe doing some basic fundamental things like, uh, you know, just, just start by uh, doing simple ministry again. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, that's just getting back into a rhythm of prayer and the word and worship, you know, every, every morning. You know, maybe, maybe your, your tank's empty because you've not been putting anything in the tank. I think summertime. Is, is every year, you know, I call it the, the summer slump. Every year, you know, summertime is a time of people, e- even in the middle of a pandemic, people are traveling, you know, people are, are uh, they're getting out of their rhythms. You know, the kids are home from school. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're being self-indulgent. You know, I mean, I love grilling out and all the summertime food. And it's just a real self-indulgent time time that takes us out of our rhythms. And I think spiritually, just, just in general, people drift in the summer. And right now, you know, as a leader specifically, you've got probably a, a spiritual slump going on. You've not been able to worship and gather and get encouragement from people and community. And then, you know, you've got the summer slump going on. You've got a pandemic going on. Uh, you can't look at metrics to get encouragement from right now, uh, you know, because you don't know what to measure. Yeah. So, it's, there's so many opportunities to be discouraged. Maybe you just need to pick up the phone, pick up the phone, make a call to one of your faithful members and just say, how you doing? Just wanted to check on you. Hey, can I say a prayer with you today? Hmm. Just basic, simple ministry. And, and here's what happens is you think you're calling them to somehow encourage and bless them. They end up blessing you just as much. That's good. Yeah. You know, uh, and so I would just, I would, again, I would ask that question. What, why did I do this in the first place? Go, go back to, to that basic question. Um, and I think you might find, you know, uh, why in that answer and how you answer that question, uh, the answer to maybe your discouragement right now and whatever, how, whatever you answered that for, I think I would just go back and, and start doing that again. Yeah. Yeah. I love that question. You know, I, I think that well, one of the reasons I love that question, just thinking about it is, I think if we really answer that question, we're honest, that question is just going to get us back to honestly, nothing but Jesus. Uh, we got yeah. in this man, because we, we met him, we love him. He's changed our lives. I know one of the things that I've heard you talk about in conversation is, is Jesus is, is Jesus and his journey, even a model for us. Uh, yeah. Would you unpack that for us? What do you mean when, when you say that? Because hey, why did I get into this? Inevitably, man, I'm going back to Jesus. And so what is yeah. it about Jesus and his journey that we can look to as a model for us right now? Yeah, yeah, that's great, Mark. I think, you know, if you look at, um, if, if, you know, it, again, like, you know, like, like Paul talks about, you know, in, in, in running our race, you know, fixing our eyes on Jesus, you know, um, I think if you go back and you look at, you know, like even in Matthew, you know, the story of just, just Jesus' story and how he was uh, sort of ordained, if you will, or how he was sent, you know, how his earthly ministry was sort of launched out. I mean, I think there's a real, there's a real key uh, a series of events that happens there. And for a leader, um, this, is, this is so crucial um, because why you do what you do is just as important as what you're doing. If you're doing it for the wrong reasons, uh, you're, you're, you're going to struggle and you're, you're ultimately going to hit a wall. You know, you've got to launch out, you know, from the, from the right place. You got to be anchored in something along the way. So, so what you see happening is, you know, you see Jesus, 
he's getting ready, you know, to, uh, to, to, for, you know, everything to start happening. And what does he do? He goes and he gets baptized. He's, he's, he goes and he, even Jesus gets baptized, you know, that, that's incredible right there. Hmm. And John didn't even want to do it. He's like, uh, I don't know about me baptizing you. And I don't know about that. This, you know, that seems backward. He's like, no, just work and just suffer it to be so John, yeah. you know? So he gets baptized, he comes up out of the water and then he hears this amazing, this, these amazing words. He hears the voice of his father say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hmm. Now, what's incredible about that, Mark, is that at that point in Jesus's life, he had not performed one single miracle. Yeah. He had done nothing. He had done absolutely nothing as far as ministry goes to deserve some, you know, accolades or a, you know, I'm well pleased with you. He, he hadn't done anything. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us that God is not interested in our performance. Yeah. That he's, that he's not pleased with us because of, you know, uh, just because of the results that we get. Hmm. So, so, so God gives him that word and, 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 you know, and, and you, th and if you just stop and chew on that a little bit, we you know, why would God say that to him at that time, at the beginning of his ministry before he'd done anything. I believe that it gave him something to be anchored in, in his identity and, and, and serves as a model for us to, to understand that, that our identity has to be anchored in Christ. It cannot be anchored in our title. It can't be anchored in the results or the numbers that we get or, or, you know, the book deal or, or whatever it is, we can't be anchored in anything else, but that word it, it, that we are a beloved son in whom God is well pleased. Now, what does he do next? He's led into the wilderness. After he's baptized, he gets this word from God and he's led into the wilderness to be tempted three times. Okay. And in the first temptation, Satan tempts him and, 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 and he tempts him, you know, he's fasting, he's in the desert. He says, you know, turn these stones to bread. And Jesus responds with, you should, you know, you, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. I think that that is so, um, I think, I think that is so strategic almost in, in what Jesus was saying in that first temptation and what he was saying. I believe what he was thinking is, and this is just the gospel according to Jeff, but I believe, I believe what he was saying is this. If I'm going to be in ministry, if I'm going to do the work God has called me to do, I have to live by the last word that I heard from God. Yeah. Right? I have to live by that one single word. And we always, Mark, we have to go back to that one word that you are a beloved son in whom God is well pleased. I believe that Jesus over and over and over again, when he was being ridiculed and mocked and he knew what he was going to face, the opposition he was going to face, he could not get his gratification from people or the results uh, of his ministry because he was rejected more than he was accepted. Um, even though, yeah, I know he fed 5,000 and that was great, but he, he got much more opposition than he did acceptance during his, you know, earthly ministry. He knew I need a word that I can go back to and be anchored in and stand on. And that, and, and that was a word that really gave him his identity. And I think we have to do the same thing. And that is, I'm a beloved son and God is well pleased with me. And that's, that's the word from God that I'm going to live my life by, by, and not by anything else. Yeah, man, that issue of identity. I, I feel like that's such a, such an important thing um, that believers need to get hold of. Um, and, and church leaders have got to get a hold of this. There's so many things that we are just tempted to put our identity in. Like you said, numbers, things that I can physically see, um, that yeah. sort of, that sort of thing. Jeff, how, how can I know if I have anchored my identity in the wrong things? 
Mm. Wow. Well, you know, that's a great question. You know, we are, every person is, you know, an image bearer of God. You know, we are created in his image. We all are. Okay. And there's some, there's some things that come with that as an image bearer of God. All right. So our tendency is always to do one of two things. Okay. We're always doing it. It's, it's going on in your heart and in the back of your mind all day, every day. We're doing one of two things. We are either um, creating an idol, you know, we, we, are either, we, are, we are either sort of, you know, making something we can worship or, or we are becoming in ourselves, we, we uh, sort of, we, we play God and misuse and abuse our own, the power God's given us. Uh, to leverage that over something else. So yeah. we're either, we're either making somebody, you know, making an idol out of something or making ourselves an idol, uh, you know, so that, so that someone, you know, can kind of, you know, we can, we can feel that, you know, God like, you know, kind of, kind of feeling in ourselves. And if we don't, then we'll just, we'll just make something, we'll make something God in our life. And it's that tension all day, every day, you know, to, to either play God, or, or, you know, or, or submit to some, some God. It's, it's just, it's just sort of wired in us to, to sort of live in that tension. So if that's true, and we know we're always going to be sort of worshiping, you know, something, um, it's important for us to, I believe, to, you know, to take time, to slow down, to spend uh, r- on a regular basis daily for us to sit and reflect to meditate, to, uh, to have qu- times of silence and stillness and times with God in prayer, uh, and in his word where he can, he can show us, you know, what, what right now are you, are you making an idol out of? What are you, what are you placing too much emphasis on? Have you gotten your eye off the prize? You know, ha- have you, have you placed your affection in the wrong place? Um, the, the only way that that's going to come is either through creating environments in our life where God can show us those things or hitting the wall, yeah. crash, burnout, where, oh, oh, I don't have any choice but to wake up because my life is crashing all around me. Um, so, you know. I think we just, I think the the real key is I don't want guys to have those stories. Hmm. I don't, I don't want guys to have those. You don't have to have, you know, a a crash, a burnout, a divorce, an affair, a scandal. You don't have to have that. That's right. Um, You know, I I mean, I know they make, you know, great redemption stories, but, but honestly, you know, I, I, I've told God, God, if I have to have a story like that to, to be effective, I'm out. That's right. I don't want to get divorced Hmm. to have a story. I don't want to lose one of my kids. I'm just not, maybe I'm just not that strong. I'm just being really honest with you today. I don't want the train wreck story. I would rather have a story, you know, of, of a guy who God, God showed him a better way before that happened but here's what here's what happens though mark and this is what i believe god spoke to me one day he said would you would you rather burn out and just utterly crash or live on the edge of one for five years wow and i said no thank you i'll take (laughs) i'll take neither please (laughs) yeah sir (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, and it, and that's, and I know a lot of leaders, you know, it's, and maybe some watching this, they just feel like, man, they've been running on empty for a while, you know, that they're, they're not, you know, they're not burnt out completely, but man, they just, they've been on, they feel like they've had a low grade fever for two years. Hmm. And I'm telling you that you don't have to live that way. If that's you, if you're watching this or listening to this, you don't have to live that way. Now it's going to take some intentionality. It's going to take some slowing down. It's going to take maybe stepping away. It's going to take change in your life and your calendar. It's going to take uh, some some change in your life. But God has a better way. And uh, you know, David even prayed it. You know, in Psalm one thirty nine. You know, when he asked God to to search him, 
and test him and know those, know my anxious thoughts. He said, and if there's any offensive way in me, Lord, you know, point it out, lead me in a better way. Yeah. And I believe that, you know, I believe there's maybe somebody that's going to listen to this, that God is ready to just start changing the way you think about life and leadership. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get real practical. So, so how would you do that? You know, several times you've used the word rhythm. You talk, you just now said, you know, making changes in your life. So maybe, you know, in, in your life, you know, talking about hitting a wall uh, or just maybe just some broad brush strokes. What are some practical things that we can do on a daily basis to, to reignite that passion, to not live on the edge of burnout, you know, those sorts yeah. of things. What, what are some things we can do? Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes I think we forget that, you know, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's on the top 10 list. That's good. That's right there with murder. <laughs> I'll just let that, I'll just let you see law on that for a second. You know, you got murder and you got keeping the Sabbath. God yeah. says equally important. Wow. Wow. You know, I think we think that that was some kind of like some Old Testament, you know, Jewish thing or something, you know, whatever, or, you know, maybe that just means going to church or, or, you know, whatever. But really Sabbath is, it's not just a day, it's, it's a lifestyle and it's a mindset, uh, I believe of constant, uh, constant rest and trust in the Lord, you know, and, and, and Sabbath, uh, Pete Scazzaro, you know, has some great teaching on, on Sabbath rhythms. I would encourage anybody to go check out, uh, emotionally healthy spirituality. And he has just some great teaching on that. You know, it's a great, great resource for understanding, uh, what he calls, you know, the daily office and Sabbath and rhythms. Um, you know, the, the components of our life are daily, you know, we live in days, we live in weeks, we live in seasons, and we live in years. I mean, really, those are the four sort of uh, in, so in terms of uh, time frames that we generally live in. And, and so daily, weekly, seasonally, and, and annually, uh, or uh, you've got to find spaces in there to practice Sabbath daily. Uh, uh, you know, we, we use the term and, uh, you, you may have heard of what's called the daily office and that's a monastic term that they just use to refer to when they would just go be still and quiet with the Lord. They said, you know, that term came from, they would say, I'm going to my office. They meant I'm going to be with the Lord because the work there, they said their work was to be with the Lord. Yeah. And I, and I just love that. And so, uh, I think every day, every day. We have to we have to intentionally have moments where we are just being with God, just connecting with God. I think that's the best way to say it. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can do that, and and there's no certain amount of time or you know necessarily you know a a a, a, a way to do that. It's really about I believe just relational connection, relationally connecting with your your heavenly Father. And then, and then, of course, weekly, we have, you know, the, the Sabbath day. I believe it's important to have a day, a 24-hour period uh, where you do no professional or personal work. That's the way I define it. No professional or personal production. And in that time, you are just doing things that refresh you. And uh, I think you, things that bring you delight in the Lord. Uh, meditate on the Lord. I believe rest, bodily rest is important to do that. You know, we usually, I usually take my Sabbath on Friday night. I start on Friday night and it, for me, sat, Saturday is my Sabbath day because Sunday is kind of a work day for most pastors and, and leaders and people that are, you know, serve in, in vocational ministry. So for me, that's my rhythm is I start on Friday night and that, you know, that may mean, you know, a good meal, you know, or being with people I love or whatever, but it's just important and it usually certainly involves a nap in there somewhere. Come on, somebody. Uh, weekly, I, my body even, I, my body knows now. My, my body starts telling me, hey, I'm, it's Sabbath. We need to, I need to rest. I need a nap. I don't even think about taking a nap all week. But on something about Saturday or Sunday afternoon, my body starts telling me. And I listen to my body you know, because God is going to use our bodies many times to speak to us, to try to tell us something. Um, and then, and then seasonally, you know, it's important to take, take days, 
a, a way to, you know, to break up the monotony of meetings and messages, meetings and messages, because that's, that's what happens a lot of times. We get bogged down in meetings and messages over and over, and it becomes uh, like production line, and uh, you just need to be refreshed, and, and I believe getting away does help you refresh. So I believe it's important to take seasonal breaks every so often, um, you know, just to take Sundays off from preaching so that you can, you know, focus. Even if you're still there at church, have a guest speaker or, you know, have someone come and fill in for you just so that you can step back for a week, maybe work on other things or uh, reflect or, you know, view it from, view it from the crowd rather than from the stage or, you know, just, just have that time. And then of course, annually, I think it's important to, to take an annual extended break, uh, you know, probably a couple weeks. I, I think, I think that may, pastors should and leaders uh, should take an extended break every year because, and here's why, because it takes us about three days to just stop thinking about church. Yeah. Yeah. You know, pe people don't know, but we, it, it, we carry so much of, of people's burdens, you know, and the responsibility of the decisions and the weightiness of that. And, you know, taking a break can help you with the pace of ministry, but separating the weight of ministry is something entirely different. The weight is harder to get away from. Yeah. And I think that's why an extended break is so important because it, it's going to take you three or four days just to check out. And then on the back end of that, you're probably going to start thinking about going back in two or three when you still got a couple of days of vacation left. But somewhere in the middle of that, you know, maybe two, three weeks, 30 days, you know, 60 days, you know, whatever it is that you feel like you can do, you're probably going to get some good rest and some time away, you know, in there. And it's just so, so important, you know, that, that we have that, you know, I think as, as part of our life. And I've even heard of guys, too, uh, say that, you know, about every six or seven years, it, studies even show this, that you need a, an even longer extended break, maybe, maybe even six months away um, mm -hmm. to, to just really take a time to uh, reflect and refresh and just reignite, you know, that passion again. But these are all, you know, forms of rhythms that, that help, uh, you know, stay fresh stay rested, uh, stay encouraged, stay reflected. Uh, you know, th these are all things that I believe uh, disciplines, if you will, that God uh, wants us to incorporate into our lives so that we can enjoy this journey, man. Uh, you know, I think that's what God wants for us at the end of the day is, uh, is to enjoy the journey. And there's going to be times it's tough, no doubt, but I, I believe along the way, he really wants us to look back on it and just say, you know, yeah, yeah, I had some tough days, but God was with me, and man, what a ride! Yeah, yeah. You referenced uh, you referenced emotionally healthy spirituality, and anybody that's watching, listening, doesn't know what that is. Familiar with Pete Scazzaro and their work? Uh, both of us have been deeply impacted uh, by that. So I'll put links to that in the show notes and everything. You can check that out. Um, one of the things that that uh, that Pete Scazzaro talks about is exactly in line with what you're talking about. It's it, who we are is more important than what we do. That, yeah. that what we do has got to, so has got to flow out of, of who we are, our, our, our connection to God, our identity as sons and daughters of God. Um, and just to take a turn in the conversation, uh, I, I think that that is what you're talking about is so important. Uh, you referenced earlier, you know, we're recording this, during COVID-19. Uh, there's so many things going on in the world right now. So many, you know, all kinds of justice issues and conversations that are coming up. And, and right now it's so important that, that ministry has got to flow out of who we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jeff, one of the things that, that I've heard you talk about is the importance of a prophetic voice for a leader. And yeah. so, so talk about what that is and why it's important. Yeah. Yeah. That, um, you know, Mark, I, as a leader, there's nothing more uh, scary and discouraging than to know that you have uh, to step up on that stage or, you know, you've got to stand in front of a group of people or even, you know, a staff meeting or whatever. And you know, on the inside, I got nothing. Mm. I got nothing to say. I got no vision. 
I got, you know, nothing to share, you know, um, I just, I got, I got nothing from God. I mean, that is a, that, you know, that's not, that's scary and discouraging. And we've all faced those moments, uh, you know, so, you know, when you look at, you know, you look at, again, back to the story of Jesus, you know, when Jesus was, was baptized, when he came up out of the water, you know, the Holy Spirit rested on him. And that was really the first thing that happened was, you know, is that the Holy Spirit descended, it says, like a dove. The whole, G, Jesus was, in, in essence, you know, he was, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. You go back and look at, at the story of Ezekiel, and he has this incredible vision, you know, at the, at the first chapter, the whole first chapter of Ezekiel is this incredible vision he has of the glory of God. And then he, he falls down and God tells him, stand up. And then what does he do? He fills him with the spirit. And then, and then he gives him a word and he sends him and he commissions him and he encourages him. But if you look at, you know, both in both instances of those kinds, you know, both the common thread was they were both filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, I love, uh, you know, the Bible says that when we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh or the desires of the flesh. And I just think it's so critically important right now. And I know this is just fundamental, but it's just so important that we stay filled with the Holy Spirit, that we, that we keep that, that fresh. We need that fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because people are looking to us for that preceding word that that visionary word and at, and as a leader when you stepped into the role of a leader one of the hats that we have to wear is that of a visionary voice we think of a prophet you know the role of a prophet and, and many guys would say well now i'm i'm not a prophet but as a leader i believe god has um part of that responsibility is having what i call a prophetic voice that means a leadership voice uh guiding people uh, teaching people, guiding them into truth, guiding them into practical things. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not just foretelling future events. You know, we think of a prophet as someone, you know, that says this is going to happen or whatever. And that can be part of it, but just as a prophetic voice, you know, we, we, we educate, we inform, we guide, we, we envision and we put, we put language, uh, to what God is doing and saying. So it is crucial that, that, that we have something in us continually uh, to share. See, ministry has to happen from what I call an overflow. Yep. You know, that, that's all ministry is it, 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 at the end of the day is ministry is just an overflow, you know, of what God is doing, you know, in you and through you. Well, I think, you know, so many, so many leaders, they, they don't have that overflow, you know, going in their life. So I would just, I would say, that if you're feeling that way, man, just, just go back to, go back to basics, just start maybe getting up in the mornings or get alone, you know, with God and just really just seek God to be with God and just seek his presence again. And just ask him to fill you with, with, with just fill you with the Holy spirit again in a fresh new way. And listen, I promise you won't have any shortage of stuff to say, the same old verses that, that, that didn't mean a whole lot to you, will, those will begin to just come alive again. And God will put those in context of what you're doing and where you're going. And, and you'll just begin, I believe, to just sort of have, feel that fire burning again inside of you. And you'll be, you'll be so excited to share. You'll, you'll have that I get to do this attitude again rather than I have to do this attitude again. But I believe it's so important that we just go back, that we just keep going back again to that fundamental place of where Jesus started, where Ezekiel started, and, and frankly, where we started, that God did a work of the Holy Spirit in us. And it was out of that, that, that we, you know, that we, that we started and we, we have to continue to keep going back to that well, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Man, just listening to you talk, it, so, so it sounds as if you are saying, man, we just need to completely rethink how ministry is done in the Western church. I know one of the things that I've heard you talk about, you know, is even a new scorecard almost yeah. of, uh, you know, things that we measure and that sort of thing. Um, man, just before I let you, can you comment on that? Because it seems as if, you know, the, the need to success the need to measure successful ministry 
by what I can physically see in one hour a week, especially in the days of COVID-19 that has slipped yeah. through our fingers. Yeah. And so could you just, could you just comment on that? You know, what, where do you see that? What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, um, I think our heart, I'll say this. I think our heart was in, was in the right place. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I really want to believe that the heart of the leaders of many movements and denominations or what have you that really wanted to evangelize, you know, we, and what we're talking about here is the evangelical church, the evangelical world that, that you and I kind of live in. Yeah. And I, I really want to believe whether I'm right or wrong, I choose hope. I want to <laughs> believe <laughs> that, that, that our heart, that, that I love our heart to reach people. I love that. And I, and it's, and it's my heart and I know it's your heart, Mark, but somewhere along the way, we just got, uh, uh, too, a little, I think too focused on growth, too focused on, uh, uh, growth at, at, at what cost, you know, the Bible tells us to always, you know, we have to count the cost of things. Yes. And I don't think we anticipated the cost of growth. You know, I was in the corporate world for 20 years and I understand, you know, some basic economics and business principles. Growth always costs you. That, that when you grow a business, that they, there, is, there is no profit in that business for the first season that you have that business on your books because you're just recouping the marketing and, and what you spent to acquire that business. There's no profit in it. It actually, you're actually losing money on new business in that initial season. And that same principle, it's interesting. This, uh, this same principle even, even applies to church and in spirituality that growth cost us yeah. uh, growth, you know, um, the constant stretching of our resources, the constant problem solving and strategies. And uh, you know, th those, those take a toll on leaders and we have to take times, you know, I mean, and we want growth, but we want measured calculated strategic growth and we want growth that we can manage. You know, how many times have we seen, uh, you know, success outpace someone's character that they just did not have the capacity to handle that type of success platform, uh, money and fame. Okay. And this is good. I'm glad I'm, and I'm glad we got here and I said, and, and, and that, that's the word I think that that's key is capacity. Yeah. And what we've got to do, Mark, is just help leaders to create more capacity, that's good. create more capacity. Uh, right. And that's, that's all we even do as, 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 as pastors, we help people create more capacity for God's love. And then really, honestly, it's up to them they've got to make some decisions in there in their own life, what they're going to do. But I think, you know, and I pray that constantly, God, give me more capacity to receive your love that I may give that love to others, but it's got to, it's got to start with me. And I think we just, at times, I think we've just celebrated the wrong things. You know, there's a saying, what you celebrate gets accelerated. And I think we have celebrated uh, sometimes the, the fastest growing churches, numerically speaking, or, you know, we, we just celebrated that probably a little too much. And I'm not saying that we necessarily need to pull back on growth. I'm just saying, I think we need to elevate health. Yes. We just need to elevate the health uh, of our leaders and pastors and create, uh, create, maybe create strategies and, and plans and, and, and environments for them to, to, to become more self-aware. Yep. And, 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 and to, and to do more self care, you know, uh, just to help guys to figure that out because we just don't gravitate to those things naturally. It's much easier to go to the, go to the breakout session at the conference on how to grow your church than it is how to grow your, your soul, yeah. how to grow. You know, it's just, if given the choice between the two, we're probably going to choose how to, how to grow our church. And, 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 and unfortunately, there is a whole buffet uh, smorgasbord of leadership content out there. There is, we are drowning in leadership content and that's great. And that's wonderful. But at the same time, I think we're starving for uh, the depth of what's happening in us and how to deal with that and, 
how to process and how to care for our own souls and how to handle that. Mm -hmm. So I think we're just, you know, one of the things we did this year was we started some online groups, uh, Chip Judd and I, we call, it's called Leader Care Online. And we'll be uh, probably uh, launching a website soon. And, and we just had to, we just started it very organically with just people we knew, but it was really just getting guys, uh, pastors and leaders in, in small groups. But um, Chip Judd is a counselor and, uh, and he brings the, the secret sauce. I just sort of play the host, uh, but he's the kind of the sage in the room. But these conversations, these safe places where guys can go and just talk about what's happening in their, in their heart and mind and in their marriage and, you know, off the stage and, you know, talk about get beyond just surface and shop talk and those things. I think that is so critical for, for leaders and pastors to make sure they have that space. And if they don't reach out to me, reach out to Mark, you know, we would love to help you find a space like that and find some community and a brotherhood where you can, where you can come and, and, you know, and, and share those things that, that maybe you can't share anywhere else. Yeah. 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 So leader care online, uh, something you're working on and that's just at the, that's just at the takeoff point, right? That you guys are putting right. it together. Um, is leader care online? Is that, that website even up right now or, uh, no, not? we are, no, Put, we're not. We, we okay. don't have the, we don't have the website up yet, but, um, we uh, just started it out with just really a five or six groups of guys that we just had relationship with. We just said, Hey, would you love to take uh, one, uh, one hour a month, just kind of a check-in kind of thing, just a checkup kind of deal to just get online together once a month. And we started this back in January before, you know, COVID was even a thing. Uh, we just had this dream in our heart and started talking about it last year, launched it in January. And the response really was uh, so great that we, we kind of had to put the brakes on it until we could figure out how to scale it. So now we're in the process of figuring out how to scale this and bring on some more uh, coaches to help us because the need is just so, so great. You know, loneliness is, you know, right there with discouragement, uh, you know, as a, as a, occupational hazard of, 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 of ministry leadership. And we just want to deal with that. You know, we're not trying to build a platform or anything like that. We're really just there to add value to guys and help them enjoy the journey, love, love what they do and love their life and stay married and, and those kind of things. I love it. I love it. Jeff, man, this has been gold. Thanks so much for uh, taking some time out. Hey, Jeff, if anybody uh, watching, listening, man, they wanted to follow you, get up with you and just uh, see what you're into, where could they find you online? Yeah, I'm on the, I'm on the, the, uh, the Insta. You can find me on Instagram, follow me on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm not, I'm not hard to get a hold of. Uh, send me a message, uh, email me riverlandchurch.com. Okay. Uh, you can check us out on there. And uh, we just, uh, we, we love you, Mark. So, so thankful for your leadership and uh, your voice in the mountains. Uh, man, I just love you, love Summit Church and uh, what's happening in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, my heart is there. I'll always be a Kentuckian at heart. And uh, man, you know, we need good, healthy churches and good, healthy leaders in every community in this world. I believe that with all my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Man, Jeff, God bless you. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah. Thanks, Mark.